Each of us is a participant in the creation of all that happens in the world. That, that, there, that we are participating in a bio-spiritual ecology, that all life breathes together, that what happens in the world is the result of what happens in each of us, that we each are like a cell of one huge body. That is such a huge mystical truth, and it's hard to comprehend that. But so long as each of us goes to war, there'll be war. It's really as simple as that. Hi everybody, it's time for another archetype video. Um, I'm obviously in a different environment. Um, I, I was flooded out of my home. So I'm in this apartment overlooking Oak Park. It's gorgeous. I'm very grateful to be here. Um, in a <laughs> bookless, I mean, I've, I brought as many of my books as I can, but I don't have my usual library around me. Anyway, I decided to do the archetype of war because that's all that's in the news these days. I mean, it seems war is everywhere. Um, and I grew up in an atmosphere of uh, post-World War II with my father who was a Marine and had served in Guadalcanal and, and his friends were all Marines. So it was a bit of a band of brothers that I grew up with. And <clears throat> I thought World War II was the last great war, as it were. And uh, I really thought it would never happen again. And I, I was lucky, I, I, well, I don't believe in luck, I was blessed to be educated by these incredibly astute and sharp Franciscan nuns who uh, introduced us in eighth grade to, what are you doing, Poppy? Introduced us to um, the story of Anne Frank and to Viktor Frankl and to the Holocaust in eighth grade, which was pretty bold if you think about it and you think about what they're doing now with burning books and what they're doing to our library system today. And here, will you please chew that over there? Uh, <clears throat> sorry about that. Um, and that they were very open about the horrors of World War II. And then what happened, and I'm giving you this background because it made, it formed me, and it gave me my passion to study war early on, um, the Bay of Pigs. And in 1963, 64, I was in eighth grade, and a number of Cuban refugees came to our neighborhood and their children came to our grade school. And <clears throat> the father of one of the kids came to address us, the whole eighth grade class. He was a remarkable man. His name was Mr. San Juan. And he spoke about his experience in Cuba during the rev when Castro took over. And he said that, <clears throat> excuse me, he said he'd been arrested and put in a cell that was designed to hold 10 people, but they squeezed 100 men into that cell. He said there was no room to even sit. They were just squeezed against each other. He said they were fed a diet of noodles and cut rat meat. And then he said for their amusement, the guards would take them out and put them against a wall and then um, shoot at them. He said, and sometimes the, um, sometimes the bullets, the guns were loaded and sometimes they weren't. I'll never forget this. He said, it didn't matter. Either way, we died. And then he said, I'm telling you this because you need to know that freedom is not a given. It is something you need to protect and fight for every day of your life. I will never forget, I, I, he, his words went right through me because 
I was under the naive impression as a 12-year-old that World War II had ended wars, had ended conflict, that that was it, it, it was over with. There'd never be another war on the planet. <laughs> anyway, after that, I read every book. From that point on, I started to read one book after another, after another, after another about war, World War II, World War I, the American Revolution, the Civil War, wars in Europe, you name it, the history of Russia, the history of Europe, the history, the wars in China, you name it, I grabbed it, I read it, I still do. I still do. Will you stop it? Here. And um, my quest was to understand why, why do human beings want to settle things with war? What, what is that? What is that impulse in us that decides, I can't talk to you anymore, I now have to pull out a gun. That's the only way to resolve this. That's it, I have to pull out a gun. So I'm gonna present something and I just want you to think about it. I, I really have, I, I remember I had my, my most wonderful teacher, my most exquisite mentor was Sister Barbara Doherty in college. And she would say, this is a learning in progress. She said, next year, don't quote me, because I will have increased my width of knowledge on this. And so with that in mind, I'm going to comment on war. And that's that, as of today, my feeling is that war is such a gargantuan archetypal dynamic. It's this huge archetypal force and it's alive in each one of us and from the time I, I, I started doing readings there was always this um, perception I had and I finally concluded that every person goes to war one way or another in our lives including me we, we choose our battles but there's a switch in us that decides that's it, it's time to, it's time to go to war. To, and, and the way we do it, we may hold resentments, we may do it legally, we may decide that's it, I'm cutting you off, I'm never gonna talk to you again. But there's, there's some, something that causes us to cross a line. Now, I didn't realize then, as I do now, how much each of us is a participant in the creation of all that happens in the world. That, that, there, that we are participating in a bio-spiritual ecology, that all life breathes together, that what happens in the world is the result of what happens in each of us, that we each are like a cell of one huge body. That is such a huge mystical truth, and it's hard to comprehend that. But so long as each of us goes to war, there'll be war. It's really as simple as that. So what is that about? Where, where does that programming start? It starts really from the time we're born when we're taught in this model that the world is essentially full of friends or foes. That, and this is the basis of tribalism, that it's either us or them in some form. And that tribalism is rooted in religion, it's rooted in our ethnic background, it's rooted in traditions, it's rooted in nationalism, whatever it's rooted in. Tribalism is this, uh, the glue that holds a group of people together. And part of the dark side of tribalism is that it, it promotes a sense of superiority within the tribe. We are better than them. And it could be because of our religion. It could be because of our traditions. It could be because of where we live. We live on this side of the tracks and they live on that side. Well, it doesn't matter. Uh, but tribalism is what you grow up in and it immediately divides the world. And it gives people a kind of permission to treat other groups of people a certain way. So automatically, 
there are um, behavioral, uh, sociological, behavioral uh, uh, rules that are set in place, unspoken and spoken, that our gangs form, um, military forms around the sense that this nation is better than that nation, this group of people are, are dominant. And the need to be superior is, again, part of the archetypal weave that is promoted in tribalism. And within that tribalism is this idea that because you're superior, if necessary, you get to take what belongs to others. You get to invade a nation and take what's theirs. You get to invade the Middle East and take their oil. You get to invade a country and take their territory. And you can use excuses. For example, this is where you can employ your religion and say, our God is superior to your God. And so our God gives us permission to wipe out you heathens or to, I mean, let's face it, the missionaries did a great job of this. The Christians were pros at this and still are. And this attitude is, is so successful that to ask people to retire this in the Buddhist language, that it's nothing but a useful, dark illusion, it's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. I remember years ago reading an article, and if I knew about what I would end up doing in life, I would have saved this article. This man wrote about his history as a spy in World War II. And he said that he adapted a whole different identity as a spy. And as such, that he so successfully stepped into that identity that he became another person. And he successfully separated from who he thought he really was. Who he, who he believed, I should say, who he believed he really was. I don't know how to turn that off on my computer. Someone commented, like, turn that off. And I don't know how to do that. So I'm such a Luddite. So he, as a spy, he said, he killed people. He raped women. He took what he wanted. He looted. He lied. He did what he thought whatever was required, and then some, without, and here's the operative word, conscience. He did not hold himself accountable in a way that this person, who he really believed he was on his off-war hours, this person who would one day return home and assume his home identity, separating from this person, and having absolutely no moral connection to that. And he said he, he, he absolutely is fine with it. And here's the killer. He said, that was the best time of my life. Can you believe this? And he also, he had been caught by the Germans and he had been tortured. And he said he would, he would go back and do it all again for the experience of what it was like to be so free to do whatever he wanted to do. That, that was so, the truth of what he spoke about was so gargantuan. Permission to be dark. Permission to do whatever I want. Permission to, and here in Jungian language, to let my shadow out. To let my shadow have at it without any restraint. Now, um, I wrote a book on woundology and the use of wounds. And what I really realize now is that part of why we cling to our wounds is that our shadow makes such good uses of them, makes such good use of them. They, we utilize our wounds 
to say things to other people, to punish other people, to, to be less than all we could be, to be unforgiving, to, be, to, to, to make negative choices that our light side would never permit us to do. If we forgave, for example, if we saw people through a more compassionate light, we could never get away with what our shadow side, our wounded self was doing. We could never get away with not speaking to someone or pouting or, or deciding they were less than us. So we need to stay, we could never go to war, in other words. We could absolutely never give ourselves permission because we would have to battle our conscience. Now, the war, wars require enemies. Another archetype, another very powerful archetype. I want to read something that was written by uh, Dr. Anthony Stevens in a book on archetypes in 1982. And he writes, the sinister truth is that for communities to thrive, enemies are as necessary as friends. External danger binds the group together, reduces personal animosity, enhances mutual trust, promotes altruism, and self-sacrifice. A, so a society surrounded by enemies is unified and strong, and a society without enemies is divided and lax. We could examine that all day long. Enemies, and let me add to this, also allow individuals and groups to break moral and ethical codes and act inhumanely. Guantanamo, look what we did to, to prisoners there, to torture people, to rape, to loot. In other words, war indulges our shadow and, bring, and allows the worst of us to come out and be okay about it because it's not really us, you see. It's the circumstances. It's their fault. They're making this come out in me. It's not me. If it wasn't for what they did, I wouldn't be this way. It's the oldest story in the book. Tribalism and the enemy is so rooted in us that, and we use it so comfortably in our everyday life that we don't even realize how much we rely on these archetypal forces to make our decisions in the world. And now when we look at the world, it is festering with tribalism again, with enemies, with the idea that it's them or us, with the idea, I mean, with the idea that all we are, we are better than these people or those people coming in over the border or this or that, and we forget all the personal spiritual training that we may have had for the past 20, 30 years be, be God's hands in the world. That what the purpose of life is, is to make this world a better place, not to grab all you can and stuff it in some bank account and so that other people have less and you have more. You're gonna die anyway, <laughs> and you can't take it with you. I mean, Another reason people go to war is that they think that there's meaning and purpose in it. The holy war, the jihad, the, the, the need to find righteousness, the need to, to, to find meaning and purpose in some kind of ritual killing or sacred killing or something like that. And, and it isn't just Islam that has the holy wars. I mean, I think about uh, the Proud Boys and they were waging a jihad on behalf of, of Trump. 
and they thought it was a holy war to save democracy in this because of this big lie that he had lost the presidency. What riles people up is uh, there's a mechanism in people that, um, oh, let me just pause for a moment and say that sometimes people will comment on my politics and that's fine, but this is a political world. This is very much a political, everything's political. Pharmaceuticals are politics. Your price of gas is politics. And what's happening in the world is political. And believe it or not, I am neither Democrat or Republican. I'm neither. What I am is a passionate American who is very, very passionate about the Constitution and the Bill of Rights. And whether or not the monster was a Democrat or a Republican, I would be against the monster. I don't care what side they're on. I could care less. But when someone is a pathological liar, I don't care what team they're on. I look at the shrapnel. I look at the damage. I look at what they inspire. And when they inspire hatred, and they inspire uprising, and they inspire violence, and they inspire outrage, and they do not inspire unity, and they, and they promise to be a dictator if reelected, I think, well now, is that what I want to see in the United States of America? And the answer is no. And so I have as much right to say something about that as any other American. And I will, period. So that said, um, let me continue by saying that the subject of war brings up the question, is it ever OK to go to war? And here's the risk. We have, to, we have to consider that these days, the risk of going to war always brings us to that place of, will someone use nuclear weapons? There's no going back from that point. There is no going back. If one nation pulls out the weapons, no doubt another nation will, and there is no recovering from that. There's no such thing as nuclear weapons were only used in Ukraine or only used in Russia. They'll be used in the United States. We're a target. They'll be used here. They'll be used in Pakistan. They'll, every nation that has nuclear weapons is going to go on high alert. And once the, na the planet is nuked, well, there goes water, and there goes food, and there goes refugees, and there goes famine, and there goes, and there goes the planet. There goes the planet. We cannot be at war like this anymore. We simply cannot. And here's, you know, <clears throat> one of the reasons I'm so supportive of the programs Tears of Firestone is doing is because she's asking us to look at our ancestors, look at our history, look at everything that we're carrying in us that we just can't afford to carry anymore, regardless of what my family's history has been in Europe and all that they suffered through, uh, all my ancestors in World War II, all of maybe your ancestors in, in, in whatever country, their pain, I can't afford to let that still be an active agent that our job is to create a future, not to relive the past. Our job is to look at the world we have now, which is a, a nuclear hostile planet, that we, we must rise beyond our tribalism and create a world where our leaders are not driven by the desire to go to war, by the desire to bomb people who are not like us. 
I, t I tell people all the time, look at your body for indication of what's happening. Your body, your, and think of it as your bio-spiritual ecology, is governed now by the template of holism, holism. And what is in one is in the whole. What is in whole is in one. Your body thrives when you treat your entire ecology as one huge breathing operation, as an integrated system. That truth is not limited to your body. It's energy has no boundaries. We are all part of one system, and it doesn't matter that we can't comprehend how that works. You don't, you don't comprehend how your body works. You have no idea. You have no idea how a thought in, influences the whole of you, and you never will. You have to just assume there must be some truth to it because all you have to do is, is experience a fear and how a fear changes your blood pressure and it changes the comfort zone in your brain and it changes your stomach and how it, it, it creates nerves in your stomach and that's one thought form, that's one fear pattern. All you need to do is say, well, that's curious. Do you actually need to know all the biophysical ingredients in that, all the procedures, all the mechanisms, all the neurological passages? No, you don't. All you do really need to get is that the power of a fear has an enormous impact on your health. That's sufficient. And then you connect the dot that if that fear is that strong, so is my hostility. And where's the end of my hostility? Does it end here? Does it end here? Or does it reverberate into the whole? Well, I'll tell you what. Walk into a room when you're really angry and you're just radiating rage and watch what happens. Pretty soon everyone in the room is going to respond to you. Maybe they'll just think, like, you'll cool the room, you'll be a cooler. That you, you'll just, everyone in the room will have a sense that you, you have sucked out the, the fun oxygen in the room. So you, you, you can influence one room, but that doesn't, it, you're also influencing the whole. We have to start applying the rules of holism to how we operate in this world. And every time we decide to go to war with someone, we are regressing in our patterns of behavior instead of saying there's got to be an alternative. There's got to be an alternative. There's got to be a third way. There's got to be a way of seeing something where emotional violence, verbal violence, hostility, aggression is not the only, are not the only forces I have at my disposal to employ. And getting to that alternative resource system is not easy because we're not used to employing it. We're, and it's, it is ruthlessly difficult to get to that place. But every spiritual master, that is their core teaching. Get out of the violence and get into something higher. That is the spiritual path. That is the only spiritual path. And I think that's the only way we will ever, ever end war. I think, you know, I'm doing a book. Andrew Harvey and I are doing a book on the shadow and the light. And, and, and part of the purpose of the book is to offer pathways through on how to deal with the seductive force of our shadow and how incredibly powerful it is and how we avoid the power of our light because we don't trust it. We don't trust it. We don't trust that the light can protect us the way our shadow can. We don't trust that forgiveness will be as potent as rage. We just don't. And so we don't trust that somehow or other finding ways of including others, people who are not like us, 
will protect us as much as excluding or destroying them. I give you this world as proof. And, and uh, to that I say it, it's a challenging, challenging world we live in. But war is simply never going to work. It will never bring peace. It never has, and it never will. All right, thank you, everybody.